Hello listeners, we've partnered with ClassicFootballShirts.com where you can get your classic, rare, retro, vintage football shirts for your football team of your choice. I recommend a Palmer kit. You know, there's some lovely options on the website. Uh, there's a referral link on our Twitter or in the description of the YouTube video. Click there, follow it through, and uh, yeah, enjoy. I say, Palmer, get it on you. It looks lovely. But from the 90s. Ooh, ooh. Listeners, hello, welcome. Uh, it's for the fans. It's earlier in the week, and uh, before we kick things off, actually, I will say podcasts will be coming out earlier than normal. They will be coming out on Tuesday slash Monday or Wednesday uh, morning. I mean, that's that's confused everybody. Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. That's the new time they're going to come out every single week. Yes, boys. Yes. Yeah, we we're trying to like sort of figure it out maybe if we're going to bring Proudy in at all at some point. Like, it's, yeah. it's, we're, we're just figuring out a, a set schedule that works for everyone. I was about to describe um, this as like a New Year's resolution, but we're we're already a month into the year, so it's a bit late to decide to change this. It's a year. February resolution. Um, but no, I'm excited. So yeah, Proudy may, may well pop up now and then, although he may well have football training on every Tuesday from now on, which is kind of fine with me. I mean, if he can't make it, then he can't make it. I mean, when there's not Monday night football, there's Proudy night football. There's Proudy night football. Do you, reckon, do you reckon he films his, uh, he films his training sessions as well? Um, I would hope <laughs> not for the sake of Proudy, really. We should just give him a five-minute slot in every show where he's allowed to talk about like anything football related. That's he, happening he could re- he could record a little sort of segment for us, like a pre-recorded little. What we should update. do is we should give him a list of all the questions. Yeah. And just give them to him, and then we can interject them into the middle of the podcast. We could call it Proudy Ponders, maybe. Just have him, have him talking this about is, stuff. This is the replacement for the feature this week, isn't it? Give <laughs> him talking about Proudy for the first two minutes. Yeah, if, you're, <laughs> if you've not seen a previous episode of Proudy, this will be very confusing for you. Anyway, uh, let's kick things off then. We're going to look back at what happened over the weekend. We'll talk a little bit about what happened uh, this coming weekend. And uh, we'll kick things off with uh, the league leaders. And it's quite a substantial lead right now, isn't it? Uh, Chelsea 3, Arsenal, a very poor Arsenal display, 1. Um, is that the title then, Jack? Was Keno right, is what um, I'm asking? I, I don't know. I thought, actually, if Chelsea beat Liverpool, it was the title earlier on uh, the week. Uh, of course, we didn't do a midweek show, but that was 1-1. One, one. Spoilers if you didn't see it. I'm happy for you to say I'm right at any point, Jack, as well. Okay. Just saying, yeah. I, I feel like nine points is still kind of surmountable. That's someone who watched Liverpool bottle a five-point lead with three games left of the season. I mean, this is True. more than five, though. I mean, it is, but it's nine with 14 games left of the season. So, I f- mm. And I saw the Atlanta Falcons on Sunday night. Oh, Very yes. So I've, yeah. seen, I've seen lots of bottling this year. So, and I saw, also saw Liverpool v Hull, so there was that. So I think it's the year of the bottle. Last year so was what, the year yeah, of the so underdog. I, to answer your question, Keno, I had at least 15 people say, are you managing the Falcons? Which was, <laughs> you know, I just love it. I just love being given this sort of idea of, oh, yeah, if, if something's gone wrong, it's probably Ben's fault, so... Yeah, uh, and can I say for anyone on Twitter sending me the picture of the guy at Leicester that wears the fox costume? Stop every okay? week. <laughs> every week I get at least a couple. Stop it now! It's getting silly. Um, Wait, you mean that's not you? That's not me. I can confirm. I've, I've not got a Leicester yeah. season ticket. Sorry, right. everybody. Just to clarify for people who don't watch like mine or Ben's YouTube videos, and are maybe just here for the podcast, Ben had to do a football manager series dressed as a fox managing Leicester. Gary Lineker yeah. got in his underwear. Ben got in a fox suit. Yeah. I don't know which uh, which you prefer. I mean, that's almost like a one, one, of, one of us has made uh, Britain's most handsome man this year. And it, yeah, well, like, congratulations we'll, again, we'll, Gary. We'll, we'll, well, re- we'll, we'll reveal who it was at the end yeah, of the season. Yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the feature this week. Who won? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> no. Um, so on on the display, I thought Chelsea looked rather good uh, throughout. It was, again, it was very... Chelsea don't blow me away this year. But my God, are they just sort of... They don't got, lose, uh, do they? They're very they hard to bunch. beat. Well, Eden Ed Hazard is particularly good again. If there's one there's shining a, light, he certainly is it. There is a a kind of efficiency to Chelsea that, and not in the same way that you'd maybe say like Mourinho teams of the past were, because the way that they used no. to grind games out. But there's a kind of um, efficiency that comes from just being clinical in all areas of the pitch, whether that is, you know, the the back three that have, have sort of kind of, you wouldn't say either of them are, or three of them are world beaters on paper. Mm. Um, whether it was those three coming together, whether it was Kante's performances recently, which have been absolutely mind-blowing, which we'll probably talk about in a bit, yeah. or the ability, as we saw with Hazard, of any one of those front three, Pedro, Costa and Hazard, to convert from, you know, from almost nothing. You know, I, we, we we didn't actually do the, the Liverpool game last week, but I did feel every time Chelsea went forward, they didn't get over the halfway line that much. But you just, you feel like when they do go forward, something's going to happen. And 
Um, it, it's that kind of efficiency that I think is the hallmark of this Conte side. I don't think there was, uh, there wasn't, although it ended up being quite a comfortable win for them. Um, I think it was pretty much the way that I think a lot of people expected it to go. I think a lot of people expected the mm, Arsenal performance yeah. to be as sort of tepid as it was, you know, really kind of um, lacking in in, in fight, um, which was quite disappointing to see, but they did have injuries. And I think that's one thing that's been overlooked. You know, when you, when you can only put out uh, Coquelin as your only recognised central midfielder, um, maybe that is Wenger's problem for not buying players, but you know, they, they had a weakened side. Uh, I think, we got from Arsenal what we expected and we got from Chelsea what we expected, really. Yeah. I mean, it, Arsenal are becoming more and more confusing because there's so much you watch them and you think, this this team could win a title soon. Exactly, yeah. And then you think, I've thought that for about 10 years and they're not doing it. And, I mean, Gary Neville had a few things to say about Arsenal fan TV, just Arsenal fans in general. And called specifically, them, specifically the guy, I think this kind of started... Yeah, he had, a wing out, when, he had a winger out sign, didn't he? Say, towards the end of the game, there was one fan who, who, or you know, at least one fan that the camera panned onto, um, who had a Wenger out sign, you know, time to go Wenger out, yeah. or something to those, those words, yeah. That if was you, how it began. But the thing is, right, if you take that in isolation, then it might look a little bit sort of frivolous and a little bit needless and sort of it's the idea of it being premeditated isn't it it's the idea of oh well we're probably going to lose so I better take this just in case but for an Arsenal fan we kind of touched on it there that this Jack is becoming almost a regularity especially losing at Stamford Bridge but Arsenal Mm. fans are getting to the point now where they pay a lot of money and and there's two ways to look at this but they pay so much money every season for season tickets and if you've got an away season ticket you look at so if you don't watch Arsenal Fan TV there's there's an older gentleman called Claude that some of you will be aware of that obviously spends every money he earns or every every penny he earns on this football club and he's not getting the return that he perhaps maybe expects Jack and and where do you lie on Arsenal fans right now because they're they're, I I think they're no longer divided. I think the majority of them do think it's time for it's, a change. It's getting to that ugly situation. Actually, I think there's some parallels you can draw between Wenger at Arsenal now and actually Ranieri at Leicester in terms of their two managers who, when you look at, their, look at the job they've done at the clubs they're at, like you'd say they've done amazing jobs. But Would you say, well, I'll come in there. Do you actually think Arsene Wenger's done an amazing job at Arsenal? I, I think he's done an amazing job to get them where I, he, he, like he has. But I think the issue is for Arsenal, they've not ever kind of fully realised that potential. They've never gone to that next level. And I guess there's an extent to which you could say, oh, it's great to be consistently in the top four. But then on the flip side, it's like, why have we not challenged for a title since 2004? Do, do you know mm. what I mean? So I feel like part of you has to be like, well, we're getting top four every year. But then, at the same time, have Arsenal truly advanced over the last five years? I mean, you could say, yes, they finished second last year, but let's be real here. Last season, if there was a year to win a Premier League title for a team like Arsenal, Tottenham, maybe even Liverpool, it was last year. And none of those teams kind of rose to it. And I think part of it is kind of that. I think another thing that perhaps weighs on Arsenal fans' minds is the fact Wenger is quite old now. And I mean that in the nicest possible way, where they kind of feel like, well, we need to get in someone new because he's not going to last forever. And the squad right now is in a very good state. And maybe it's better to switch the manager now than to wait five years, change the manager, and you have a kind of Louis van Gaal situation at Manchester United. Yeah. Well, do we think, though, Kino, that part of it for Arsenal fans is that they're seeing change everywhere else? They've seen it happen as close as Tottenham. Obviously, yeah. Conte's coming. Klopp is, is... I know Liverpool go through a ski patch at the moment, but he did sort of reinvigorate the club for a while and arguably still will. Of course, Mourinho's going to Manchester United. They're seeing change everywhere. They're seeing some positive effects. They're seeing some negative effects. And I think when you've had the same thing for 10 years, you now want to see a change. And at, at its core, that lies with Arsene Wenger. There, I, I do agree with that. I think that... Uh, we, we sort of began this by talking about Gary Neville, sort of, uh, and the comments he made. I think he was actually wrong on that. I don't. I mean, I mean, in the specific situation, um, it was kind of a bit silly to bring a sign, sort of preemptively expecting your team to lose. I think that was stupid. But um, t- for Arsenal fans to be expressing their discontent about Wenger in that way, to me, is absolutely justified because, as you say, they have um, they had the new stadium that was about ten years ago now. Um, and despite that, or since then, 
as you say, there has been change all around the league. There has been success at many different teams in the league. And I think last season really was the chance for Arsenal if, mm. if they wanted to, you know, if, if Enger wanted another title before he goes, that was their chance. And I think the Arsenal, the, the, the discontent of the Arsenal fans this season is, made, is sort of made even worse by the last 12 months that they've had when, you know, a year ago they should really have been going on to win the title and they, they weren't able to do that. Um, mm. the, I have read a few little articles and stuff and that have said that Arsenal may be actually sort of not not formally, but kind of informally sounding out potential managers around Europe. The the ones that I read, oh, I forget the name of the guy at um, Red Bull uh, Leipzig, um, and also Thomas Tuchel at Borussia Dortmund. Yeah, um, th- they were the two that I kind of w- were name checked in these articles. Potentially managers that Arsenal might be sort of interested in, which would be quite interesting to, for them to go for. But the the despite that, the fact that they are looking into that suggests that maybe they are now picking up on the fans' discontent, which I think, as I say, is totally justified. I think yeah. another thing that comes into this, actually, is the fact that I don't think the Arsenal fans would be as vocal about getting Wenger out if it wasn't for the calibre of managers who have come into the Premier League in the last yeah. two or three years, maybe even one or two years, really. You kind of look at all their rivals. They've all kind of brought in fresh blood. You know, you look at the teams really in the Premier League. It is a merry-go-round, particularly at the top clubs. You know, you're not having success if you finish top four at a team like Manchester United. Your head can be on the chopping block still. And yeah. I feel like the difference is at Arsenal, it's, there's almost this content from the people above at where the club are now. And I almost wonder if it's a bit of a safety call. You know, you don't want to risk taking that step back because you're kind of content with what you've got. But I, I don't know, I feel like the reason it's bubbling up mostly is because of the amount of Premier League matches who have come in and the fact that it seems like Arsenal are the most... Loyal, and I've never seen loyalty kind of turned as a negative, but it almost feels a little bit like that. You know, they don't want to let Wenger go. It's almost like they're waiting for him to leave of his own accord. Well, yeah, I think I think that their philosophy, which which is kind of fair enough, really, is to let him do it on his terms, as you say. It's the Um, the predictability, though, isn't it? It's like it's the predictability of what happens and the attitude towards that. It's gone from being for Arsenal fans very comfortable and feeling safe and being told, you know, got the Emirates now, everything's going to move on, and now. While that really hasn't changed, like there's now a point of well, we're still giving you a grand every every year to, to sit in your ground, and think, we're still seeing a fourth place finish and whatnot. I think another gripe is going to be that the nature of Arsenal's transfers, really, with the exceptions of Urzel and Sanchez, they've never, or well, maybe Czech as well. They've well, not well, they, brought well, they in bought, a load of, they've not brought in title winning players over well, the they years. Bought, they spent thirty five million pounds on Xhaka, and it's yeah. like he's a, he's a decent player in Europe. But is he going to change everything about Arsenal? I mean, he might he might add a little bit more solidity to the core, but even he's been suspended we, we recently. Have he also still had, can't, can't prove it. We have also had this week our yearly Wenger. I, I was uh, going to sign him yeah. with Kante. Every year it's like, well, we were going to sign. It's like, well, why didn't you sign him then? Did you see the projected sort of I could have signed team that Wenger? No, has, but has sort I, of I'd said. love to see it. It'd be an incredible, it's like, it's it'd be like, a championship it's like, winning side. It's genuinely just like Suarez, Messi, Ronaldo, Pogba, just every every like good player you could think of in a four in a, like a four uh, four three three. Thing and is, it, does you must think that's going to help? Because I don't think that's going to help him. Like, well, well, it I just makes. I feel like it takes the pressure people. off him and, and puts the pressure on the board, and says, "Look, if we had a little bit more money here and there, we could have brought in this sort of team." And then you look across the other side, and with Chelsea, I mean, I'll say now, I think, I think that's it. I think Chelsea can't be beaten. The, t- the teams behind them all have to play each other far too often still. For it, for it to be a case of how are Chelsea going to drop points and someone else go? Yes, and uh, it's taking yeah. it's taken a little while. I didn't think I, like at Christmas, for example, I still thought I was game on. But at this point, with Liverpool dropping off as they have, nobody really taking advantage. Maybe Spurs, but do you, like, do you genuinely think Spurs will, will leapfrog Chelsea? I don't think so. I, I mean, think I, was, I saw a really interesting February, you know, stat sort of. actually, which was that versus the top six, the Premier League top six, so Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester City, Tottenham, United, and Arsenal, Liverpool have dropped the fewest points against the top six. But obviously, they've dropped like yeah. eighteen points against other teams. But Chelsea, they've only dropped eleven points against other top six teams. But then against everyone else in the league. They've dropped two points all season, yeah, which and is, it's that consistency. When you look at you, when you look at Liverpool struggling against Hull, when you look at United drawing against Hull, and then you look at Chelsea in the way that sometimes they are able to grind out results, not necessarily playing the sexiest of football. Mm. I, I mean that that's the difference. And Chelsea, they've just been the team that have been just consistent against every calibre of opposition. Whereas I think there's some teams that are better suited to playing certain styles where it seems like Conte, obviously he 
didn't have the best start to the season. He kind of rethought things a little bit. Actually, ironically, kind of following a defeat against Arsenal. Yeah. And since those tactical changes, I mean, Chelsea just look like head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Do, do we both think then? Do we, do we all think, sorry, that um, it's, I, that it's I, think, I feel like most teams go for a patch where they maybe lose games back to back. I say yeah. this, Arsenal went unbeaten one season. I think the true test will actually be when Chelsea maybe do suffer a shock result against a smaller team. That's the, the How thing do is, they Jack, get on? I, the, the thing is, I don't disagree with you on that. I think team, you know, the, there's, there's a chance that Chelsea will maybe drop multiple sets of points between now and the end of the season. The issue is that I don't, I can't see, other than Spurs possibly, I can't see a team that is going to be relentless enough to actually capitalise on well, those drop points. I personally think That's Leicester are going to win the league and they're going to win their <laughs> next 15 games and everyone in the top six is going to lose all their games. All right. It can't actually happen. But no, there's not, there's not prediction. Fi- there's not actually, there's actually not 15 games left, Jack. Paddy, but I, I, there, 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 that. Uh, there is I for s- Leicester, is there not? No, 14. Oh. I saw odds today that Paddy Power are offering uh, 200 to 1 for Leicester to go down and win the Champions League. So if anyone anyone's a betting man... Could be worth I, I should say do Chelsea need one. Well, they need four more points to exclude goal difference to make it so Leicester can't retain the title. Do they? in February? I mean, I, I think it may well happen. I, I, I bet on that. Um, let's move on then. There was. Uh, do you know what? we've not had a big scoreline like a big big scoreline for ages? It's nice to last, see. Last last one I can remember with nine was the five four before Christmas, but that wasn't sort of. Uh, yeah. I felt like that was that was kind of ding dong. It wasn't so much like an amazing performance from either team. They were quite scrappy goals. I will yeah. say this, that this was, game that we're talking about, Everton v Bournemouth, felt like a FIFA match. It was that kind of game where momentum seemed to mean nothing. And no, it's just scoring for fun. Have, have a chance, have a goal. It, it's like funny that. though because as I sort of mentioned, I've written in the running order here. There was there was a, there was a period where obviously so this, it was six three. Lukaku scored four. Um, there was a period. In, I think it was after once Bournemouth got the second goal. So it was it was three nil to Everton at half time, mm. um, and then Bournemouth. Uh, scored two. I mean, the fir- the one goal was extremely good. I think the first goal that Josh King scored with the ball over the top from Wilshire, fantastic touch from King, and then the finish. There was that goal that went in. Then Ryan Fraser crossed for for three two, and then there was a period for about ten minutes in the second half, from like sixty to seventy minutes, when the Everton fans were on top. They were they were not happy. Everton looked ropey, and Joel Robles made some I think two or three fantastic saves yeah. to basically keep Everton in it. And it could have been such a different game had I think it was a shot from Harry Arter had one of those shots gone in um and uh but but then eventually it, this is as you say it was kind of like a fifa game the momentum shifted so quickly back in everton's favor well um, look at who's got two in two minutes that will exactly shift yeah <laughs> that'll, yeah that'll with, shift the, with the form that he was in showing that game and the form he's been in recently um you know there, there, there was a threat and I, I think it was a combination of lukaku and barkley being fantastic a special mention to ross barkley i think he's created the most chances of any english player in the premier league this season i did also enjoy um, his celebration before he shot yeah yeah yeah. we'll get on to that one but so so it was a combination of those two and bournemouth's um how should we put this uh Horrific defending? Shit. Horrific defence. And defence and defenders. I think yeah. I brought this up, though, the fact they've conceded three goals. Like, maybe the start of this year, like, it was a good month ago, a few shows ago, we talked about their, yeah. so their defensive I issues. It, I think it was about ten times then, Jack. Now it's 13 or 14 times they've conceded three or more goals And they've not won season. in 2017. I think it's quite interesting for Bournemouth because they're a team who... They've lost two key players this month, in this last month. They've lost Wilson to injury for the rest of the season. And of course, Nathan Ake, who was probably one of their leading kind of well, lights at the back, has been recalled from well. loan. Obviously, hadn't been able to stop the the dreadful, as we've just said, the, the dreadful defensive record that they've shown so far this year. The issue for me, I think, is that I mean, in, in some ways, it's kind of a, a almost a positive for Eddie Howe that he stuck with the defence predominantly that got him up from the Championship. I think of players like Steve Cook, Simon Francis, um, Adam Smith. Can I, um, they, did you say that's in his defence? Like, I mean, well, not, not sort of ironically, obviously, but... Uh, no, 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 yeah, in, in his, I think it's, it's it's in the same way that we just spoke about loyalty at Arsenal, I think it's kind of credit to him in a way that he's given them a chance in the Premier League, but I think it's begun to backfire. So I kind of think that's... What, I kind of think what you said there is... I don't want to say it's bollocks, Keenan, but it's kind of bollocks, because Eddie Howe is, is notoriously said as, oh, he's the next great English manager. They've won one game in eight... Last season, they conceded 67 goals. To give you some context, that's the same as, I think it was Norwich, and that's more than Newcastle who went down. So they, I think they, they were sort of, in, in goals conceded, they were in the top three. Now, they then went out and spent £50 million on a player like Jordan Ibe, who is an unproven talent at Liverpool, 
and brought in one defender, or one centre-back, I should say, in Mark Wilson. Now, Eddie Howe clearly then had money to spend, and in my opinion, spent it in the completely wrong area, no, the area they, in which he yeah. knew there were problems, and, and put it elsewhere. And so, like, so they, they, they did made buy one... Brad Smith, to be fair. <laughs> Well, not left back Brad Smith. Yeah, but it's just, but it's, it just strikes me as if you can be, you can be a great man management, like the sort of manager. But if you don't have the players to to work a system, and Bournemouth are lucky, really, that they had such a good start to the season that they still stand five points ahead of sort of the next little group with Leicester, Middlesbrough, etc. If that didn't happen, they could be slipping very, very quickly, and they could be in this fight I with think, the bottom yeah. six. Like, I, I, I think yeah. Eddie Howe, as much as we like to praise him for being sort of a, a, like a law manager, in many ways, this is just this is very naive to, to like I not fix this quite clear issue. There's quite a big difference between if you look at teams that have come up and sort of really solidified their place. I think with Swansea, um, Southampton, those are the two that spring to mind. They had in Ashley Williams and players like font as well who's only just left sort of really solid Premier League standard centre halves that were almost with them already mm, do you know what yeah. I mean um, and they were leaders within the team that's fine for a season um, though isn't it though I feel like that's the sort of thing you could do for a season cope with it for a season but then at some point you've got to go yeah, 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 let's yeah, change yeah, it yeah. off Norwich no, went I down are. because they, they failed to do that by the way that, that's quite a good example Norwich came up and did this exact thing didn't strengthen their defence properly and paid the price and Bournemouth it's been interesting to see lucky. It's been interesting to see, obviously, one of the big defensive signings that Eddie Howe made for quite a lot of money was, I think, Tyrone Mings from Ipswich, was it? Was it Ipswich? Yeah, it was yeah. Ipswich, yeah, about 11 million. Last year. Wow. It, it was a lot of money for a young, um, fairly, you know, not unproven in the Premier League, at least, centre-half, who then he obviously got injured for pretty much the whole season last year. So he's almost been like a new signing. He has not looked good in the games. That, I mean, he's only been back three or four games, so it's given him a bit of yeah. credit. He's had a long-term injury, but um, it's been very difficult for him to sort of assimilate into this back four. January's gone. There won't be any chance for how to change that really too much between now and the end of the year. Um, and it is a huge problem. And I think as good as bringing it back to the game, as good as um, Lukaku was in one of those those moods, wasn't he? Where yeah. he is, where he's lethal. Where he quite literally um, looks like the best striker in the world. Yes, and they, they, uh, but, uh, but you know he's kind of not because he doesn't do it anywhere near as consistently it, enough. Yeah, the, the the consistency thing is key with him. I think it's not. We we all know that he has the attributes to be a fantastic player, you know, and play for some of the biggest clubs in Europe, in my opinion, you know. But it's the consistency is the key. But he was in one of those moods. As good as Everton were, it was just it was made even worse by by the boom of defence. And Eddie Howe would have been absolutely furious with the fact that they they almost managed to claw themselves back into the game after going three 0 down. It looked as though Everton had wrapped up the game, and all the fans thought that as well. But their defence was still incapable of keeping the minute at that point in the game, and that's what I think was really most disappointing. I, I, about I will this say, result. do you think that Bournemouth knew that Nathan Ake was going to get recalled from loan? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. If there they was, did. I don't know if this was confirmed by anyone, but I read on tr- deadline day that they actually put in an 18 million pound bid that was accepted, and Ake was given a choice. Like it was down to him I, if yeah. he moved or not. What 18 million bids for Nathan? Uh, 18 million pounds for Nathan Ake? Yeah, I don't know if that was ever confirmed. I remember reading about. I think Sky Sports tweeted it out. So I don't know if it's true, I, I don't know if it wasn't, think, but it was definitely so that was going around on deadline I, day. I think, I'm not sure it was Bournemouth that made that bid. They definitely tried to keep him. And I'm, as you say, it's in, it would be interesting to find out. If that is true, that's more knew. annoying. If you've got 17 million to spend, go and get some other defenders in case. Yeah. Like, oh, that, that's annoyed me more, Jack. You shouldn't have told me that. Baffling. Um, Apparently Chelsea rejected £18 million. Pounds. Eddie Howe wow. revealed that a week ago. Well, Conte must be a fan then, clearly. Um, what I love, about, like, we were just talking about Lukaku there. What I love about Rome, Le, uh, Rome, Le, Le, Romeo Lukaku is that in his sort of first full season for Anderlecht, he scored 19 goals at 16 years of age. It's like Amazing. in Football Manager where you like, get that one very good youngster and you just like the same realistic. Followed it up with 20 the next season and then obviously got his big move to, uh, to Th- Chelsea not long peaked, after that. peaked at 17. Well, interestingly, Lukaku, like I, this can't this can't be right. What I'm reading, but Lukaku never scored for Chelsea. Possibly, I mean, I mean he was out on loan. That sounds like a pub quiz question when he goes back yeah, to is, Chelsea in the summer. We, I, I, we I, said, I'm reading it now. I can't. I'm struggling to believe that's true. But since Chelsea, I should say, 17 at West Brom, and then in the league anyway. Well, actually, we'll do total 16, 20, 25, 17 this year, and 25. I mean. 
He is inconsistent. in the Premier League as well now. Well, he, is, he is now, yeah. But, uh, he's, the way, he's that, the way that Lukaku scores goals, he's quite streaky as a goal scorer. I, do you know I will what I mean? say... Like the, a bit like the phone. I, I don't know how yeah. much of that's him being streaky, how much of that is Everton being streaky. Well, Everton yeah, are quite streaky. That's, that's, that's fair. Everton are a very streaky side in this league. Yeah, and I think you can make the case that Lukaku, as you said, you know, he's, he had a very good season for the Albion, but also, you know, they, they're not going to consistently put guilt edge chances on for him. I think if he was in a team that was really set up around him and was really consistent, imagine if Lukaku was playing uh, as, as instead of Harry Kane, say at Spurs, like yeah. the amount of chances that they lay on, he could be top top in the scoring charts every year. I think um, it is obviously, as you said, it's a good point about the club. Um, should we do a little? But, should we do a little feature, yeah, a little mini feature about Lukaku? Okay, yeah, right, go on. I mean, we'll all take part. Where do we think that Lukaku will be next? Chelsea. Do you think? Do you actually think that? I think he might. I find that fascinating. I'm glad someone said that because I would have said that if you didn't say it. Kino, where do you think he might pop up? I think it depends. It depends on how well Everton do over the next, I think, eighteen months. Assuming he, be... assume he moves, though. Assuming he moves in the next sort of two years. So yeah, so let's 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 say that Everton finish strongly, you know, sixth or seventh this year, and they go on to have another Steady really on. good, and then yeah, and they go on to have another good year under Coman next year. I could see him moving uh, sort of anywhere in Europe. Really, I wouldn't really say that um, anywhere particularly would be out of reach. Obviously, mm. you know, sort of the, the kind of super clubs type thing. But he could do a job for an Atletico Madrid or a, a team like that. I, I, well, I, no, Europe, K- Kino, I'll ask you the question. Jack was very very clear on it. Which team? Know. Chelsea. What type of team, Callum? Because I know no, you no, I don't want to type. I don't want to type, Jack. I want a, I want a team. I'll go then, Kino, and let you think about it. I think Aubameyang will probably go to Real Madrid. Yeah. And that will open yeah. up Lukaku at Dortmund. Oh, now he's on the bandwagon that you've just suggested. Well, <laughs> okay. And now he's decided. <laughs> no, that's a very good point. On that same token, let's say Griezmann goes to United. Good. And, yes. Uh, he could go to. Atletico Madrid is Callum's answer, everyone. Note it down. Let's remember that for when he ends up at Manchester United. Well, um, you all noted down my Chelsea. Yeah. We did. We did. Well, we, much as we noted it down, it's been scarred mentally by you on, on all of us. Um, <laughs> right. Shall we move on then? It was. I mean, I've been saying it for a few weeks quite flippantly, but it's very true. Crystal Palace are absolutely awful. Like, <laughs> Samuel Dice has gone to Palace, Jack, and, it, and they've gone from being scarily good to scarily bad. It's comical. Uh, well, I thought I just went on the sackrace.com to check the manager sacking odds because I knew Allardyce was coming up. I was thinking, is he the favourite to be sacked yet? Oh, who is the favourite to Ranieri be sacked Ranieri is the favourite. And is to be he? fair, today they've done the thing that you don't do as a man, ah, as a club. Where you get the vote yes. of confidence. That's like the dreaded thing. <laughs> More like, on that later. More on that later. I mean, it, it, was it De Boer Inter giving the vote of confidence sack two weeks later? Like, it's not like that's not the vote of confidence. That's the vote of everyone's talking about we should probably talk about it too just to shut it down if we can so, so where's where's Sam in that he's, um, I'm looking he's, at seventh. seventh seventh yeah behind Karanka Puel that's payout that's payout related they're going to have to pay him loads if, he, if look, we sack, like, if they yeah, sack him you are probably right although Venga's only just behind Sam Allardyce yeah that's crazy well I'll read it out actually I've got it up to one now so it's Ranieri then Karanka at Middlesbrough which I think's a little bit. I mean, he, he's always he's, he loves to sort of toss and turn, doesn't he? Although it, it is against that time in the year where, like, a championship side who got promoted, you know, they start to panic a little bit. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd, be, that'd be crazy though. Uh, then Claude Puel, which is considering they're in a cup final. See that? Yeah, but that's quite. That's not unreal. Cup final. They have won six, uh, lost six of their last seven. Cup, yeah, I cup think final. That- Mm, They've lost six in the last seven, and the only team they've played in the top six there is Tottenham. (laughs) Can keep saying it? Keep saying cup final. I mean, mean, let's be real here. Van Gaal got to a cup final and was like sacked before he could celebrate it. Well, that is very true. That's very true. (laughs) Um, But I mean, what a win that is for Sunderland. I mean, talk about must wins as well for both teams. I've never heard um, like home fans react as badly to sort of, you know, away goals in the way that oh, come I did on. that, that Come on, you but, scored Villa last year. You were there. I don't think, but I, I think most of the Villa fans, when goals went in, were more sort of just... <laughs> yeah, too busy walking up, out. Up, yeah, just sort of, yeah, yeah, well, partly that. <laughs> too, busy blurred ex- up, too busy blurred out their plastic stakes. There was just kind of sort of acceptance, but, but Palace are going down <laughs> angrily and I couldn't hear the Sunderland fans celebrating, the, uh, particularly the fourth goal, was it, I think Defoe's second, um, just before half time I couldn't even hear the Sunderland fans celebrating because the booze was so loud from Sunhurst mm. Park and the game was essentially over in it was in those five minutes not so much after the first goal there was a little gap and then 
Uh, who was it? I think Defoe was the second goal. Then who was it in between? Uh, I think Defoe's like third and fourth, actually. But, forget, yeah, and but I I the thing you, is, Jermaine Defoe, if there's one player in that Sunderland side, you go, don't give him space in the box. It's Defoe. And he got like two bits of space in the space of like five minutes before yeah, half time. Re- I repeat, Jack, Crystal Palace are absolutely. Like, I don't know what's wrong with them. I genuinely don't know what's wrong with them because they've got some like. Relatively good players, scarily they're, good players. Some well, say. The thing is, right, their first eleven on paper is sort of mid-table Premier League, but it's like it's like it's like watching Liverpool defend Palace. That's how bad it is right now. It's it's not good, and especially when you've got teams attacking a lot more regularly. I mean, it, they're that bad, boys. That Sunderland have scored four and a half against them. Yeah, and, and I don't need so was, much more than that. While we're analysing the game, there wasn't really much in the second half because the game Palace showed, and almost that was that was almost the worst part for me that oh. about sort of watching this game was that after they went four 0 down um, in the second half, you'd at least maybe expect to see a bit of a rally and to try and push for maybe a goal. I feel or a like couple, if you there's know, a team you go four 0 down to, and you think right in the second half we can get four and draw it four four, which exactly. does occasionally happen. Sunderland are probably that team in the Premier League this year but, that you yeah. back yourself to yeah, do it again. But- but there was nothing. There was nothing from Palace in that second half at all. And you, you, I mean, we discussed this before. Ben, you have to. Sam Allardyce had had worked so hard for all those years. Sort of, England was his dream job, and and he got that job and blew it so quickly. Uh, Unbeaten and though. Ba- and yeah, and his back it. <laughs> and his back in, Yeah, and his back into management, like you know, very. You know, pretty quickly after that, what is motivating him now? Like, I, I know Ben, you said that you can, at you can maybe, again. well, yeah, maybe, maybe, but in this, in the short term, this, I'm not sure this is the same Sam I say that Sunderland signed even, you know, two a year and a half ago. Um, in terms of you know, avoiding relegation, I'm don't, not sure it's the think, same one. Don't you think though that managers like this? And I, I mean, Pulis has had the same thing labelled, and now we'll look at West Brom having a very good season. But it's like. The reputation of being a manager that keeps a, keeps a team in the division is quite a brittle thing because f- fail it once and it'll always yeah. be referred back to as, but what about that time you didn't do it? Like I, I can think of quite a few, I can think of one or two managers that have had this reputation of being a survival manager. And then, well, I'll tell you who had it. I'll tell you who had it and then lost it and got a little bit lucky in many respects. Not many clubs, by the way, have gambled on him since, it's worth noting. It's Harry, Harry Redknapp. Yeah, Harry. Who who obviously had that spell where he kept teams up, then went down, then ended up at Spurs, went to QPR, failed miserably, quite frankly, and no club. Like, you look at the clubs down there at the moment, you think maybe the talk of Eddie Howe might be sort of on the chopping block. It's, like, Redknapp's the sort of person that could be linked to that, but I've not heard his name anywhere. I feel like the high Redknapp phenomenon has sort of subsided, is gone. I don't, I don't want to, like, distract us too much here, but what happened to Paul Jewell? Because he was weekend manager and he kept um, them up for a few years and then he vanished. It, like, he was another... Actually, I don't I, think he's doing, like... I can imagine Paul Joel sort of doing Phoenix Knights bingo. I'm going to find out for us can what want, he's doing. Yeah, can we find out? There was, though, of course, that he obviously had that tape that he did once with a, with a female. So he managed Wigan for six years, then he went to Derby, then he went to Ipswich, and then he vanished. What did he do? Yeah. In after... Suffolk. That, that Ed Sheeran song is actually about Paul Jewell, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's shocking. Yeah, that is strange, actually. I wonder what he's doing. I can't find out anything about him, what, what he's listeners, doing. Listeners, he left by if mutual you, consent. If, well, he does. He, sometimes he pops up on Sky. His last position was an assistant coach at West Brom. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read on to which he was appointed in January 2015, but from then, which he resigned only a week later. Right. Oh. Listeners, but, if you've seen Paul Jewell out and about recently, hashtag let us know. where is Paul Jewell? Where is Jewell? Well, I'll find I'll the Jewel. update next week. Find, find the Jewels. Are there any other <laughs> managers in the Premier League who have just kind of vanished and left football completely? I feel like Ian Dowie has, but he's just on Sky still. But Al- he... Alan Kerbishley. Oh, yeah, Kerbishley is a funny one. Actually, I should say, when you... <laughs> I love that. When you type Paul Jewell um, into, into Google, it comes up, people also search for... Chris Hutchings, <laughs> Do you Chris Hutchings, uh, Mick McCarthy, Alan Kirbishley, Billy Davis, and Terry Connor. I think it's quite harsh to throw Mick McCarthy in that little group there. Which I quite, Phil Brown is, is another one that comes on that oh. list. I mean, it's Ugh. quite an interesting list, it must be said. Um, so yeah, where is? I mean, how did this happen? Paul Jewell, Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, Alan Kirbishley, 2013, was appointed technical ed director at Fulham. He was yeah, removed he was. two months later, and then he joined Fulham as a coaching staff member 13 months later. 
Right, what's he doing now? I think he's still at Fulham. There you oh, go. Because okay, well, they're doing well. Did they lose to Birmingham really, this Sam weekend? Allardyce needs, Sam Allardyce needs to go back to Bolton, bring them Did back f- to glory. Am I right in thinking Birmingham have won in like nine and then ten for Fulham and just won like one nil? Yeah, I've not heard... Uh, I've not heard the last of that from a housemate. Today, oh, okay. So. Well, because they won a match. Yeah, well, no. um, yeah. okay. Well, there we are then. Sunderland four, Crystal Palace nil. <laughs> in summary, uh, let's move on then to relegation threatened Claudio Ranieri and Leicester, who again have been beaten. I mean, last year this was the this, this was the fixture that Vardy got his his record. This time round, they're setting slightly different records. Manchester United win obviously three nil, and um, well, they look very good. We'll start with Leicester. One point. From the relegation zone, the team that won the title. Eight points in the last ten. I will say they're saving grace actually at the moment is that it's kind of a, I don't want to say a well-known fact, but generally speaking, 38 points, a point every game keeps you safe in the Premier League. You sound, sound like, sound like right, uh, right now, Trump there are those six te- There are six teams below that threshold who have scored less than a point a game, and Leicester are one of them. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have read about this, but there seems to be a growing kind of... I want to say alleged quotations, kind of cool. uprising. Where on earth is this going? Go uh, on. Uprising do, do I need to bleep Leicester any of this out, Jack? That um, you know, the the Ranieri's actually lost the dressing room. I don't know how true that is. Some people yeah. are even saying he might have even lost it before the end of last year, which seems mental to say now. But I mean, I feel like you look at them. I mean, do, should we go down the line? Do we think he'll be sat this year? Do you think he should be sat this year? Like. I think it, it, you know, it it may have been that a winning team always has a good sort of atmosphere within it, doesn't it? Really, while mm. while while you're winning, that can you can paper over any types of cracks really that you might have in team spirit. Um, so maybe it was true. Maybe he was. Um, a bit of a taskmaster, say, or was, it was kind of didn't have the best relationship with certain members of the dressing room. But because they won the fucking Premier League, you know, who cares? Like that, they, they managed, they could live with that while they were still doing that well. Yeah. Um, I think it's been clear from some of the attitudes of some of players. I think probably Rian Mahrez is the one that stands out to me. Mm. Uh, Analysing this season's performances, the attitude of certain players. Well, Achoa wasn't looked... there. There was the drama with Achoa because he was yes. told that if they received a bid of six million pounds, he could go. And then Sunderland put in that bid, and then another bid of eight million, and they rejected both. Yeah, and there's, there has been a few stories coming out this season about that, and and I think there were a few moments during this game where I, I looked at um, a couple couple of players from that sort of who whose lack of commitment maybe led to the United goals. The first one was um, I think Christian Fuchs when. Uh, who, who tried to track the runner and Wes Morgan for the goal that uh, Mata scored um, with Mkhitaryan, who was fantastic, we can talk about in a minute, was uh, played Mata in. Morgan was on his heels, um, Fuchs didn't track the runner, and then when the goal went in, there was sort of arms in the air and looking at each other. Um, the, the Mkhitaryan goal as well, where he ran through... Um, past a one-on-one the defense was looking at each other in, in a way that they definitely you know kind of weren't at all last season you know what they were looking they were looking around going, where's Kante where is he well you say that, save but us that's kind of, I, I think he he papered over a lot of cracks in that defense Gary Nineke tweeted at the weekend that no, oh my God, know, I'm not sure he papered this, over the cracks I mean that's a, well, bit, no, that's a bit harsh uh, this, I don't think Wes Morgan set the Premier League a lot in his first year in the Premier League. But what I'm saying is, they weren't really and cracked. You can't win the league with cracks, in my opinion. Like, even- I think we... No, OK, fair. But I think Hooth and Morgan this year, as I was about to say, Gary Lineker tweeted, Hooth and Morgan this year have gone back to just being Wes Morgan and Robert Hooth. Yeah, I mean, like, that's what I would agree with, that they are now... And, sort of, it's almost like the superhero potion has worn off, and now they are now back to being those defenders that we thought and, they and were you, before. And, and you combine that, I mean, Kante in that Liverpool game last week made four times as many challenges as anyone else on the pitch. Like He's, he's he, made more tackles in the last three years in the Premier League than any other player. He's been playing yeah, in the Premier but, League for a year and a half. Yeah, but Jack, his pass completion is only 70% or something I mean, ridiculous, is what people say. The, the fact that he's got more tackles than any other player in the last three years in the Premier League and he's only been playing in the Premier League for a year and a half, yeah. it's just mental, can Worth I just say? saying that uh, the second player on that sort of list is, I think it's Gway, isn't it? It may well be. And he was only there for one year, so... Yeah, yeah he's, he's like got a ridiculous amount as well. I should say, Jack, ever since she mentioned... The points tally thing about teams not having as much. It made me just refer back to last season and which teams didn't have as many. Newcastle, you're right, 37 went down. Norwich, 34. You forget, Callum, that Villa had 17 points. <laughs> that's less than yeah. anyone else. In that's the less league than at this anybody point. else currently. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> I didn't mean, I didn't mean to bring it up, but I can't believe it. Aston Villa like, are worse than Hull. We beat uh, Derby's oh, yeah. record, at least. You know? Yeah, you did. You smashed we it, did. George. So we have did. that. Uh, <laughs> right then, a little bit about Mkhitaryan. He, it's almost, I mean, we've said this a few times now, every time he plays well. It's almost like Manchester United bought one of the best players in the Bundesliga. <laughs> It is. He has the potential. He, I mean, we we didn't mention the brilliance of Eden Hazard's goal too much in, in the Chelsea. He Arsenal scored a goal like that up. against every single top team. I feel like over the last few years, like he scored the one against did Spurs. You see, did you see that tweet today? That tweet Mc- was doing the rounds. I did. Which tweet? Which tweet? That, that, uh, uh, Hazard has scored against like the top teams and scores like a, an amazing goal against all the top teams. <laughs> I mean, as as we just said, I, I think Mkhitaryan has the potential to be that kind of player for Man United. Oh, just Mkhitaryan. Um, 26 sort I want mid-20s say. yeah yeah so he's I would still Google got him but I can't spell his name just type 25. in Henrik mate it'll always come 20, up 25 or 26 and so he, yeah he's in the prime of his career United are going to get a good three four years out of him at his peak and um, it's actually 28 he looks, wow sorry really yeah, yeah. oh I mean fair, fair enough but just turn 28 but yeah 28 yeah yeah uh, it seems bonkers that Mourinho didn't use him earlier in the season. Maybe it was because he was still struggling to settle in. And he's hit the ground running since sort of about mid-November when he first was brought into the team so well that maybe it was a good decision by Mourinho. Um, mm. But I thought United looked in this game incredibly slick in a way that I have. I know they were playing Leicester and they've been in bad form, um, but they kind of dispatched them with this sort of routine away performance that you expect of Man United of old. And it, you see performances like that and it makes their kind of stutter reform this season all a bit more confusing because um it, the mid the, the the way that their sort of front six works when they're playing well and I include actually Marcus Rashford in that who was although he has his scoring record is not good in the Premier League this year he's not scored I think 13 games now um he was actually pretty instrumental to much of the good stuff that went on during this game um sort of playing off the left and not because I, I I mean to an extent you know he's his number nine position well you have Zlatan at the club he's not going to have that mm. um and so he's had to to adapt his role a little bit and I thought him on, and, and Mata on either side with Mkhitaryan buzzing around in behind Ibrahimovic looked incredibly good as he should do considering the money that you know they've spent on that team uh, and I think it brings the best out of Paul Pogba because he's not expected to constantly deliver defence being passes and beating men and stuff he can pop up at certain points where he's really needed and um, it, th- that sort of front five worked so well yeah, um, I've got an and, incredible uh, Mkhitaryan fact for us. Oh, go on. It's just his name is spelt no, with no, some no, different. No, although consonants. when I typed in Henrik M H K was all I needed to type in for it to guess. Oh, good. But um, the fact is, in 2003, age 14, bear in mind he lived in France at the time. He had trials with Sao Paulo in Brazil alongside Hernanes and Oscar. I mean, that's a long way, isn't it? Like, how do you end? Because he's Armenian as well. Like, it's not like he was ever in. He never lived in South America. But he just had trials at Sao Paulo. Be cool, wouldn't it? Oh, I mean, that's the, a little bit what's random, the isn't it? What's the that? link there? I don't. Well, I think his dad was a professional footballer who died actually quite young when he was when Mkhitaryan was still a kid. It's very rare for a Brazilian club to come into Europe to poach young. It's like the reverse, isn't it? Of the where, in Ukraine, yeah. where they get all the Brazilians in. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, yeah, actually, Mkhitaryan's father died at the age of thirty-three and was was an army, army international. Uh, well, well, of course, though he he wound up at Shakhtar, and that was where he sort of made his name. So maybe there's a connection there between sort of the Brazilian That's true. Um, scouting yeah. and 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 where he. Started. I can't yeah. imagine that like, Oscar and Hernandez looks over a Brazilian fourteen-year-old and just this Armenian kid turns up. Bit, maybe maybe that's random. where he was seen though by Shakhtar. Oh, true. I mean, if, if if you want to get in touch, Henrik, Chapter. then uh, <laughs> if you have any clues to the origins of Henrik Mkhitaryan, just yeah. Well, what if you, if you get distracted by Paul Jules' whereabouts? Then by all means, let us know. Uh, what's <laughs> no, I like to believe that Mkhitaryan is currently looking for Paul Jules, and he hasn't got to this bit in the podcast yet. Yeah, I'd like to think so. <laughs> he misses this bit because he's too busy looking for Paul Jules. Um, I mean, he was he has been he managed Wigan. He's been seen in that area of the of, of England. So I mean, keep an eye out, Henrik. I once uh, had Lancashire Monopoly that had the DW oh stadium back you did. then on it. Why on earth did you have Lancashire Monopoly? I think my grandparents were from Lancashire, so it had it had actually black. <laughs> it had, it that, had is even, not, that is them not knowing their grandchild. Well, I mean, partly knowing their grandchild. They got it for you for good to say. It had but, Ewood Park. It had the DW Stadium, and then it had the Reebok, and they were like three of the most valuable bits on Lancashire Monopoly. There you go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lancashire Monopoly. I mean, God. I was. We should play that for a, a video maybe one day. That's the most northern thing we've had on this show, surely. Lancashire Monopoly. Well, let's go a little bit more northern. I mean, not really. It's whole Liverpool. Um, 
A hole two, Liverpool nil. Let's just not talk about Liverpool. Let's talk about how. I'm not even good surprised. A... No, neither am I. Let's let's talk about how good of a job though that Marco Silva is doing at Hull. It is. I mean, I'm at the point now where I think Hull will go will stay up. I, I've gone from thinking they're the worst squad and worst team to thinking with some of their additions and with the new manager, they've got every chance. I mean, because Crystal Palace are awful, but you, you know. have to you have to look at the situation of Hull at the beginning of the season, the situation that Silva found himself coming himself coming into, uh, and then say if he does do it, it's got to be one of the best sort of escapes we've ever seen in the Premier League yeah. because of just because Hull had I'll 14 fit players at the beginning of the season 14 first team players that were fit to play yeah. um, and they've had a hell of a lot of injuries since then they were bottom of the league Phelan was doing a poor job spirit was obviously very low and Curtis Davis did an interview the other day where he said that they've had about two days off from training all year since the start of 2017 mm. um, and he kind of was I mean he meant it in, 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 in kind of in jest but then sort of said oh we, I, I've, I've been under uh, many English managers and they've always given us more days off than that you know it's quite yeah. a foreign manager thing um, and you can tell that that is working the way I mean as you, you guys probably watched the game that the, the way that Hull defend is is so so organized and I've seen the similar thing at Swansea um, under Paul Clement um, both those managers have really been able to organize their teams in, incredibly well and still keep them as we saw you know uh, Sw- uh, Swansea obviously scored a few against you at Anfield right, and then did me. did pretty well against City away mm-hmm. as well they're able to convert chances too as well as being good defensively I want, um, yeah. I want- that's what's most impressive. I will say, I've been really impressed with Silva's buying. He did quite a lot of business at the end of the window. The, the brought in players like, is it Niasse from Everton who scored? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There's a few other players they brought in. One of the, the players they brought in, a player who I'd only heard negative things about from it, like Italian football fans, was uh, Andrea, is it Ranocchia? The, well, is it Ranocchia? I thought Ranocchia, it was Ranocchia, yeah, from We'll Inter, go with yeah. that, it sounds good. But apparently he's one of the worst like defenders that Inter yeah, ever was, had in an own goal machine. Say, Against Liverpool, yeah. he looked like the best player in the world. So if you're, I thought, if it, was, you're, I thought it was Beckenbauer, mate. I was if, like, if, who's, this, who's this guy? If you're Turned Klopp, up. just sign any Italian centre-back, basically, is what I've learned here, and they're going to be an improvement yeah, for he, us. Yeah, Ren- Ren- does have a bit of a... Um, a does have quite a bad reputation yeah. in Italy, yeah. Got, um, I but think I mean, he's got a bit of a sort of Ryan Shawcross-esque reputation. He's like, you know... He's he's yeah. a good defender. He's just not a great defender. And, but probably, and again, though, obviously, prob- in Italy though, you can, I imagine in Italy you can be a little bit of a bad defender, and due to the nature of Italian football, you're an awful defender. I mean, he's played yeah. 21 times for the Italian national team, so he can't be awful. But no, I just imagine be him being a liability. Yeah, well, from what we heard, anyway. Um, as you say, though, he's done some good business, and it. As, as you mentioned as well, Ben, the, the form of other teams right now in the league suggests that I think really looking at those, Hull and Swansea are on the up. Yeah. We talk about momentum and, and it's crucial at this end of the season. Those two teams have momentum and they are now, I think Swansea climbed out of the relegation zone. We weren't meant to talk specifically about that game, but Swansea, I think, are now out of the relegation zone. They are zone, indeed. Or at least. Um, and Hull are touching sort of goal difference in yeah. there. So like one point those two are on the up. I will, yeah, I will say... It's interesting for Hull. They've got Arsenal at the weekend, so I mean another tough game. A bit of a freebie though. Away at the Emirates, a lot of sort of tension around the Emirates. Just Hull play win, win for a, Arsenal fan TV. Do it for me, Hull. In a similar way, um, they then play Burnley, Leicester, and Swansea in a row. And the, the big the big thing for me is sort of the run in for Hull is really really interesting. So they play Tottenham on the final day. Let's ignore that for now. Let's focus on the fact they played before that Watford, Southampton, and then the final two games are Sunderland and Palace. Huge. I mean, my God. I mean, that's going to be fun, isn't I, it? I just want to repeat, I think it was 2003, 2004, where none of the teams in the bottom three were confirmed as relegated. Yeah. I, think might be four, I think it might be 4-5, because that's the other West Brom set up, right? Oh, yeah. Well, well, up, I remember four, Norwich needed to win, and they lost 5-1 against Fulham away. Like, I mean, there's a way Jack, to go Jack, down. Jack, I'm mugging you off here, Jack. It was 6-0. I'm really uh, sorry. Interest, interestingly, you would have said that yeah, you would <laughs> sorry, have said Jack. that before. The, like, <laughs> I, want to, I want there. to believe that. I want to believe Norwich scored once in that game. No, they didn't. It's, it was awful. It's, Jack, that was almost fifteen. Full of full of the cottage. Feel old now. Interestingly, though, you would have said that before this weekend, there was a little Sunderland, if they hadn't have beaten Palace, that's sort of thrown a bit of a cat amongst the pigeons because they would have been maybe about five points off safety. There was a little gap between Sunderland yeah. and the others, but yeah. that win has really brought them back into contention and it is incredibly tight. I mean, there's uh, Middlesbrough as well, who's also on the same points as I think Leicester or something. It's uh, yeah. about... Middlesbrough, Leicester, Swansea on 21, Hull 20, exactly. Palace, Sunderland on 19. Um, worth noting that Swansea and Hull's goal difference is a little bit worse than everybody else's. 
So that, I think that's that just because of the bad, me. bad sort of first, bad kind of 2016 that they had. Yeah, at the start of the season. But I mean, at the, come the end of the season, that could be an issue, and that is where actually Palace's goal difference of minus 13 may give them a little bit more of an advantage. The thing is, their goal difference was good until they played Sunderland. Very like true. Minus nine would have been okay. So Sunderland are now going to finish with positive goal difference. I'm, I'm convinced of it. <laughs> we'll see. If they win every go four 0 it'll happen. Um, so yeah, good result for Hull. Liverpool are just a joke at the moment. Just it's just I, so predictable, isn't it? Like, it's I, yeah, it's not fun. There's it's just this fun. inability to cut down teams and also look solid defensively. I feel like Liverpool are very off balance in the centre of the midfield. Actually, at the moment, that's one yeah. thing that I think has become more and more apparent. As much as individual errors have cost us points, I think Hull exposed a glaring weakness when it comes to Liverpool having a real anchor who can basically encourage other players around to be yeah. way more creative and worry less about their defensive responsibilities. There's always this fear, I feel like, for the centre midfielders of Liverpool to actually push forward. Well, this, this is the first time since sort of the end of September that Liverpool have been outside of the top four. So um, not not great, really. It's just, it's funny because basically Liverpool keep playing, and we'll talk very, I'm going to talk very specifically about one player, which I wouldn't normally do, but having watched it now for a year, I'm getting a bit tired of it. Klopp has decided that Emre Shan is a better option than Wijnaldum, and I don't really know why. And it's getting to the point now where mm. I'm getting somewhat frustrated with how often Emre Shan is playing and not really contributing. And while I think Emre Shan's a good player, there has to be a point where you go, well, he's not the best option today. So we're, we're going to have to bring in Wijnaldum, who I actually thought, like before his little injury, was one of our better, more consistent players. And I, I wonder if it's any coincidence that he's been taken it's out. Popped up with some important goals well, as well. Well, he's not really he's not started as many games next to Henderson in the same system. Obviously, Mane left and that caused its own issue. But we also started like not playing Ronaldo and Henderson just as a two and having players in front of them do all sort of their creative stuff. And I, I don't know. Em- Emre Shan's not really impressed me at all this season. And I'm, it's a shame because I want to see him progress a little bit more. I, um, I I do feel a little bit odd about all this because there was a point last year. I think it was where Liverpool lost against. Southampton and Skirtle came on off the bench at half time. I think I mean, like Liverpool, any any Martin Skirtle game has been marked from my memory. So yeah. I think Liverpool lost three 0 but I actually kind of griped in that game about how I thought Klopp was a little bit naive against smaller teams and how we kind of, we were struggling against them. Mm. And it almost feels as if a few more teams have kind of worked that out as of late. Obviously, I know the draw against Chelsea is a very different game, but this game against Hull, it, I I don't know. I feel like there's some odd decisions being made at times. I still don't think Klopp actually knows what his best team and system is at Liverpool. Did you see the the big stat today is that Jurgen Klopp has an identical record to Brendan Rodgers? I mean, Brendan Rodgers like finished games. like second or third in the Premier League. One well, what's season, curious so. about that is that I mean, how do we read that? Can I, I'll come to you actually. How do you read when you read that? Do you immediately think that's not very good or that is quite good? Because there's two ways to look at it because of Luis Suarez. Like, how do you mm. look at that? I think it, it, it. What matters more, I think, in terms objectively, um, as you say, Brendan Rodgers was it finished second, and he had Luis Suarez and stuff. Yeah. So uh, you, you, you know, I, I don't think you could sort of read too much into that fr- from an objective point of view. I think it's a problem in terms of kind of PR, media pressure, and reputation for Klopp because yeah. uh, that that the me as much as you know. Uh, players and managers and people within clubs say that you know what the media is saying doesn't matter too much that informs then i think what the fa- the fans are the people that consume that right and then they go into the ground with those kind of preconceived notions about what's going on at the club yeah from what they read yeah. in the papers and i think a stat like that and, and i'm sure you know if this run continues more kind of stats like that will be churned up by people that does affect how particularly the atmosphere at anfield will be mm. right um, and I think that's really what comes out of that that potentially could affect the performances on the pitch. Um, it doesn't look, as, as you say, if if you were really kind of looking at the ins and outs of a stat like that, it's not really too bad because you did have one very good season. You had obviously Suarez, Sturridge and uh, Sterling were playing fantastically yeah. well as well. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's not really a fair comparison, but it's bad optics and, and yeah. that can affect the atmosphere. It's, it's a bit like, uh, is Klopp getting more out of a lesser team? That's kind of it, the question. Is he always, yeah. and that, that's the and big it, point. 
and it's been noticeable, I think, maybe the FA Cups were, were kind of an unfair one to judge by, but I think the atmosphere on this run at Anfield has been, I've noticed it, has been a little bit flat, or at least flatter than it, well, than it has been. <laughs> and it was in, I, I, did, I saw one, so I'll just finish this one quickly. No, that's okay. I saw, I saw um, an interview, it was kind of an Arsenal fan TV equivalent for Liverpool, right? It might have been actually from the Liverpool. Yeah, Echo, the Red Man, was, was it the Red Man TV or was it the Echo? Mate, yeah, could it, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure, I don't know don't, too much. Was it, it was like a fan it, interview thing? Yeah, it was an okay, interview yeah, fan. I, I know what talking, you're about now. Yeah, you, you've probably seen it, talking yeah. about the atmosphere at Anfield post and a main stand, right? The, the, the new renovation. And, and that, he did mention that the amount of corporate seats are there now and, and the fact that it's kind of sort of half marketing Liverpool is a bit more of a tourist club than it perhaps might have been in the past. When they're not playing well, you maybe notice that a bit more. Yeah, I think, than, I think that's a bit of a, ironically, this is quite a bit pun heavy here. I mean, that's a bit of a cop out. Generally, I, th- I, I, I actually, I actually think it is though. I think that that's. I think it's a clop out. That's sort of the well on Jack. That's the sort Any of thing. Others? That's the sort can of we, thing we, you say we, when you, as you say, that's the sort of thing you say when you lose it. I will say, I, and I feel like this maybe isn't getting out as much as it perhaps should do. Although it seems blatantly obvious, being a Liverpool fan, that I am still one hundred percent. There's not even a shred of me thinking Klopp's not the not the right man for the job. We yeah. hired Jurgen Klopp not for this year, not for last year, but for the next three or four years. He wasn't brought in as a, let's have a quick fix here. Because you look at our squad, our squad, I'm being genuinely honest here. I said it at the start of the season, and I'll repeat it now. Our squad is a fifth or sixth best team squad. There are five teams, or maybe four teams, that are better than us. So, and I'll argue with anybody that that's the case. Jürgen Klopp's job is to get Liverpool from that point into a Champions League spot and then push on from when you can attract those better players. We're about where we should be at this point. We arguably overachieved in the first half of the season. It's just the manner in which the performances have happened over the last month and the collapse. That, like, if this was more spread, for example, say we lost a game every month rather than going sort of months where we went unbeaten, there would yeah. obviously be a lot different attitudes to us being in fifth. But it's the manner in which it's happened that's causing the, the, the discomfort. It's not actually the position itself, I don't think. I think Liverpool fans need to be a little bit more what's the word a little bit more realistic realistic exactly they need to realize where we are and what our standing is and that Jürgen Klopp isn't an 18 month manager Jürgen Klopp is a 48 month manager so let him have that time and if it doesn't work after that then you make a change or you do what Arsenal do and keep him for 12 years and suffer (laughs) but um there's there's two options there I think Liverpool need to realize that uh as as do fans Jack do you agree with that another Liverpool fan I do you you mentioned Rodgers earlier I just want to can we extend a, a dear Brendan thank you and uh, oh, congratulations, because, um, well, Celtic, they're 27 points clear, Celtic, with 14 <laughs> games left of the season. They the, the, rec- the record for a major European league is 31 points at the end of a the season. They're unbeaten at the moment, Celtic, and they've got 27 points Amazing. clear. Do you, think, Amazing. do you think he's telling them to not let this slip? I, uh, hope, I hope not. I don't think he needs to. So, <laughs> I mean, Kino, mate, they can lose the next nine and it'll be fine. They'll be level. So that's the situation. Uh, we're just going to take a quick short break. We'll be back with a preview of the upcoming Premier League action after this short message. This particular podcast for the fun show have linked up with ClassicFootballShirts.com, the home of the classic rare retro vintage football shirt. Uh, all of the shirts are original and officially dating from the seasons in which they were worn. You can find a referral link on Twitter in our YouTube description uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Get yourself one. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, honestly, the range is ridiculous. There's a, there's a Norwich away kit, a Palmer home kit, anything you want. It's, it's madness. Right, let's take a look ahead then. We're going to quickly stick with Liverpool. I know you're probably getting sick of the Liverpool chat, but we'll keep it brief. Oh, God. Um, really? 5.30 on the Saturday, Liverpool play Spurs in what is said to be a really good game. This happened very early in the season, if I remember. I think at the time we said, I'd love to see this around sort of a February, March time when both teams are at full pelt. Sadly, Liverpool have been dropping off, as I just mentioned, uh, so it won't quite be like that. But both teams, by and large, apart from a few injury issues at the back for Spurs, will be relatively full strength for this um how do we see it go we'll come to Kino how do you see this going so it's a kind of it's a kind of battle of like the the, the pressing game isn't it the Gagan it is there'll be so of... much pressing there'll be some iron shirts go on it, yeah it'll be a very high energy game I think that's certainly one that you can expect in terms of results um I'd maybe be in favour of a draw or something I think it could they, they has the potential to cancel each other out it'll be interesting to see if Pochettino maybe goes for the three at the back to try and unsettle maybe Liverpool and, and, and to try and give their front four something a little bit different to think about. 
Um, that may yeah. be something to watch. Well, the more, the more defenders a, t- a team have, the harder it is for Liverpool. So, well, yeah, uh, but that, that's the other. In there. That is, of course, the other thing that Spurs could do: try and do what Chelsea did last week and and really shut up shop. It doesn't see. I mean, I can't remember Spurs playing like that really in the league this season. Mm. So, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, but, but of course, that has been proven so effective against Liverpool in recent weeks. So, it'd be interesting to see if Pochettino tries to do that. I think in terms of like outcomes of the game what can really happen in terms of like the top four of the title race I think if Liverpool win that's the only real meaningful result because yeah. I think it basically gives Chelsea the league title because so let's assume that they beat Burnley or at least get a draw they'll go either 10 points or 12 points ahead of Spurs who are their nearest rivals so yeah. and then it's, if, it's likely that if, in that case City will become the closest rival they play Bournemouth exactly. on the Monday and all of a sudden City might be like sort of 10 points behind so, yeah, so if Sorry. Spurs slip up, that's their certainly their challenge gone, and it's pretty much handed the title to Chelsea. Yeah. So other than that, if Liverpool win, it kind of keep. Uh, sorry, if Spurs win. Everyone's or a draw. Everyone sort of stays where they are. So that's the big result that would really change things. But where do you see it going though? Who do you think's got the edge in this one? Uh, I, I'm tempted to say a draw, a score draw, because I think both teams will. I can't see Spurs doing what Chelsea did. I don't think they've got the players to do that. Um, I think both teams will probably score. Okay. Um, and they'll cancel each other out. I've got, I've got a prediction I'll make, but after Jack has given me his little I'm going to be thoughts. very negative here, I'm afraid. I'm going to say 2-0 Spurs. That's the, that's the logical part so? of speaking. Two, two so Spurs, can we have a little bit of a reason why? Uh, well, Spurs have the best defence in the league. They've only conceded Fair. 16 goals. They've only lost one in their last 10, and that was 10 games ago, so they're nine games unbeaten. Fair. Liverpool which is a club, didn't which score is a club, against record, Hull. They got one against Chelsea. Can't defend against Swansea. And I think when you look at Spurs, they're a team in pretty good form. I know they scraped by against Middlesbrough as of late, but one thing that they've really However, shown is that they are going to be difficult to break down. And I could just see them just outplaying Liverpool, I'm afraid to say. How, however, Liverpool do have a good record against the big teams this season. Mm. So they they, maybe they will up their game. Maybe they'll play well. I mean, you say that... like. I, I'm, not I'm, I'm, I'm the sorry. optimistic one here. This is, this I'm going <laughs> to gonna gonna put my neck on the line here, boys. Oh, no. I think Liverpool win 3 0. And I'll, I'll go with a why, Spurs fans. I look forward to your tweets um, <laughs> at the weekend. Uh, I th- I think Liverpool are more dangerous on the counter attack. And I don't think Spurs will sit back. I think Pochettino will come at us a little bit and try and play off those defensive insecurities. And as Kina mentioned, we are far better against teams that come at us. It's, no, it's not a coincidence. Like, teams that try and beat us, we tend to beat. Teams that don't try and beat us, End up beating us. It, it's very, it's very, it's very funny, really. Um, so I, I think at Anfield it'll be a game that Liverpool fans will be up for. That like we talk about the criticisms of Anfield, it does get quiet, but it gets quiet against games against like Swansea and things like this, where it's maybe a little bit more difficult to get really up for it, to get really hyped for it. Game, yeah. a game at Spurs, uh, an evening kickoff as well, half five. I just think this is the sort of game that Liverpool relish playing in, and. I don't know. I just think. I just think three nil. I don't know why. Okay. We'll see. As I say, Spurs. Okay. See you on. See you on Saturday night. Uh, prime, look for, prime your tweets, everyone. Look, Get them in safe. I feel like I'm the draft in Ben's tie. Well, well, Spurs aren't. No, no. I'm pretty negative about Liverpool, are they? <laughs> but Spurs aren't as good at the back without Vertonghen. So that's what I'm interested to see. And yeah, we'll, we will see, won't we? Um, from up to down, Swansea play Leicester. Who'd you back for this one? Swansea. That, that is difficult. We've got a Swansea straight away, Keno. <laughs> it's. It, I mean, we should probably talk about. Uh, can I just say? I've been negative about Leicester forever, so I have to maintain that. This is quite a good way of doing it, though. We'll say who we think, then we'll say why. So, Jack, do you think Swansea will will pinch it? I do. Keno? Um, it's at the Liberty. I Leicester have a dreadful away wec- away record. Away, 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 away record. record. Uh, hello, yeah. <laughs> Where is Roy uh, Hodgson so I, now? Do we know? Mkhitaryan, yeah, find we, out for us. <laughs> or any other listener, Paul Jewell, uh, Roy Hodgson, or Henry Mkhitaryan. Where anyone? You know, just if you see him. Yeah. I, I'm going Swansea this game. Um, they have. As we said, it's a huge game because if Swansea win, they will leapfrog Leicester, possibly send them into the relegation zone, depending on results and. Uh, you know, we mentioned the sort of 
the, the, the deadly kind of um, vote of confidence from the board in Ranieri today. It was a very formal statement as well. Oftentimes you hear it's maybe like um, they might release a verbal statement or the chief executive might, you know, do an interview or something like that, yeah? But it was a, a written sort of official club statement backing Ranieri explicitly. That's quite risky. And if they lose that game, it will it will almost look as though it was like a preemptive sort of strike from Leicester. I think the, the pressure if he loses that will be huge. Uh, um, okay, my my so word for Leicester is... is They've scored three goals in their last nine games. Mm. They've conceded three goals in their last in three of their last four games. Looking at you, Mr. Vardy. I'm just I don't know where they're gonna get wins from if they can't score. I mean it's not rocket science, is it? Like they've got they've got to get goals from somewhere and Achoa's been pissed off and I think he wants to play for Leicester again. You look at like players like Slomani and Vardy, neither of them's been the players that, well, in some ways, you thought that they were going to get, and in Vardy's case, the player who he was last year. And uh, Mares, I mean, it, it's just not the same. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, who is that? That is, oh. that is Paul Jewell. Ah, ah, uh, yes. I'll I, explain what's just what's happened. On, uh, yeah, I've seen what's on the bottom of the photo. Have you found out where well. Paul Jewell is? Uh, no, well, well, where uh, he was in 2008. Um, he was. That's all we'll say on that. Yeah. I mean, if you've not seen the picture of Paul Jewell pleasuring a lady, I may have just put it in our group chat and, you know, couldn't contain himself. Uh, I can yeah. imagine being quite a smooth lover, though, so. Oh, can you? I mean, let's not go into that. Um, I might we'll, have to bleep some stuff out. Here, we'll leave that right there. <laughs> okay, well, it's interesting. I think with Leicester, they've always, they've always got this now. They've always got this idea that on their day, they can be quite good, can't they? Will we see that against Swansea? Probably not. I think Swansea will do it. I'm quite impressed with Clement. I think, I think very been, impressed with him yeah. so far. Yeah, I think yeah, I think yeah. he he looks like quite a shrewd operator. But you know, he's a season away from becoming the next Allardyce. So we'll leave it there. Uh, and then finally, will Chelsea win the title on on uh, on Sunday? They've got Burnley. This could be this could be the weekend, as we said, as I just said that that could wrap up the title or it could be the, the weekend that the title race suddenly is back on because the gap may only be six or seven mm. points because if Spurs if Chelsea either, they're going we should say they're going away to Burnley uh, the early kickoff on the Sunday uh, and Burnley as we all know have I think the third best home record in the Premier League um, it's a very very tough place to go certainly one where you could see Chelsea maybe not losing but potentially getting a draw if Burnley play well um, and two points drop there potentially with a Spurs win suddenly makes the gap at either six or seven points depending on what happens and uh, it, it suddenly looks doable again. Um, alternatively, Spurs could lose, Chelsea could win and the title could be over. So um, it's it's interesting. I'm tempted to go for the draw on this one because I think um, Conte probably knows that as we've said throughout this show, other teams aren't particularly consistent to, to really capitalise on 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 the, the gap on any potential drop points from Chelsea, um, so to get a point here in a tough away game would be absolutely fine. And I could see them maybe not going as defensive as they did against Liverpool, but certainly being quite uh, you know cagey in how they play this and making sure that they see out the game if they can nick it great and if not take the point. Yeah, I, I would. Agree. Do you know I'll agree with a lot, a lot of what you've just said there, Callum. Mm. Uh, Jack, thoughts on? Chelsea five 0 Okay, right. I feel, like, I feel like <laughs> sorry. I feel like for a not a lot of teams in Burnley's kind of position, like they they haven't actually drawn in their last ten. They're kind of a win or loss team, and I feel like it's at this point in the season that a team like I mean, Burnley. To be fair, Jack, most teams are win or loss teams. Well, no, no, because a lot of teams do tend to draw games, particularly in their position. Whereas I feel like Burnley, they either seem to turn up and give a really good fight, or they. They kind of struggle. Although that said, they have done okay against the likes of City and Arsenal recently. But I just feel like Chelsea are on a whole other level, and I feel like mm. Burnley—they're almost at a stage now where there's not—I don't want to say there's not a lot for them to play for, but they're quite comfortable in mid-table. Yeah, for you me know, though, the, the stat about Chelsea dropping two points to lower league or like lower division opposition yeah. is the key thing for me. Like, kind of done, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of, i feel like this game's already done before it started. I mean, Burnley are now going to win, so congratulations, Burnley. Well done I to Burnley. Wrong. Look forward to your tweets on Sunday. Uh, any other games you want to talk about? I mean, Arsenal play Hull. I think that'll probably be a home win, but I mean, we would as all quite enjoy a Hull a, win, wouldn't we? As you said before, it's a bit of a freebie for Hull because they've picked up four yeah. points against Liverpool, Man United away and then Liverpool at home, so they can afford to sort of not take this game easy, but it won't really matter on this result per se. Their season won't be defined by it. Mm. So 
Um, again, though, if they get a point, say, against Arsenal, again, like they did at United, Wenger, more pressure, etc. Yeah, I should say, if, if like, say, say Arsenal, Manchester United win, I mean, for argument's sake, let's say Liverpool and, and City also win, that makes the top six really, really interesting, because Liverpool will take points off Spurs, obviously, that will draw them closer, City will then leapfrog them, Arsenal will be on 50, so for example, so just to explain that then, Liverpool will be on 49, United will be on 48, City will be on 52, Tottenham will be on 50, and Arsenal will be on 50, which would be, I mean, as tight as it is at the bottom, would be the same thing at the top, apart from Chelsea, who are doing that, aren't they? Um, United play Watford. I can only see that being a Manchester United win, if I'm completely honest. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, boys. Are we, are we still there? Are you still with us? Well, I, was, I wasn't prepared for these predictions. They weren't in the Sorry. running order, so you've found me for a leap. Middlesbrough, Everton. This is like classic. Everton have got a really good win. Middlesbrough will win 1-0, I feel like. It's got that feel to it. Mm, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Possibly. Everton are unbeaten in their last seven. I'll go 2-0 Everton. Cheers, Jack. Uh, Lovely. Stoke Palace. How many do you think Stoke will score? I'm going for like nine. Peter Crouch to score two and do <laughs> a robot again. That. Oh, we somewhere. should, yeah, especially, we should mention that. Yeah, he did pull out the robot, didn't he? I like yeah, that. He pulled out, pulled out the robot for 100 Premier League goals, which is quite an exclusive You know, the, the issue with that him. celebration was... There's no it's issue a, with it. What are no, you going to no, say No, 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 no. It's a bit like you're with some mates, like when you're 18, and one of them could do a sick dance with you, and you remember it being incredible, and then kind of six years later, you meet up, you go into town oh, together, and he pulls out the same dance move. And it's just not the same anymore. You know, he's not done it in a few years. His hips, they're not quite in the same shape they once were. He can't do the move. And it just kind of ruins your memory. Like the robot for me, like Peter Crouch was good at doing the robot. Watching him do it in front of the Stoke fans. It's a bit like watching your dad dance at a wedding reception. It had that feel to it. Heavens. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, well, we're doing nods last weekend. Uh, Jesus is not bad, is he? Gabriel Jesus. He's decent. He's slotted in very quickly. We didn't talk about City earlier. But... I think he looks really good, boys. I think he could be really, really good. I was a bit worried they were going to get Robinho number two. That's kind of but, my asso- association of Brazilian strikers with... He's got, I dare say he's got a bit more of a Neymar feel to him than he has. Robinho. It's true. Yeah. Three goals in three games. Aguero dropped for him at the weekend. Yeah. It was a bit, a bit silly to see all the speculation about Sergio Aguero's future. Yeah, one game. Sure one flipping game. He's, he's like, back relax. to Atletico, boys. I read it. He liked to post on Twitter. Did he? Uh, no, he didn't. That's just the thing that happens, isn't it? Now with oh, the scandal. Right, okay. Sal Payet began. He liked a Marseille tweet. Well, Al- Alex Oxlade Chamberlain liked a Wenger outpost or something on Instagram. <laughs> of course he did. I like that it's become so subtle that players are like, well, I just like this. So I'm so annoyed. Like, it's the most passive aggressive thing, thing, isn't it? It is strange. Uh, shall we quickly talk about, well, before we go, a little bit of any other business. Uh, Philip Lahm's going to retire, boys. I mean, what a servant to, to football. To football, yeah. And to right backs everywhere. He was like, if you ever created, for me, Philip Lahm was like, if you ever created a best team in the world and you had four at the back. Genetically perfect right back. Yeah, F- Philip Lahm was always like, it, it was almost a bit of an oddity because it would be like a few La Liga players, a couple of Premier League players, and then Philip Lahm would just be right back because he was always going to be the best right back. Uh, the thing is, he's only 33. Like, he's not that old. But then I he retired like from national quite football like. quite early, didn't he, as well? Like, but he well, could be a manager in a year, Cup. I feel like. Yeah, I, I quite, I actually quite like what he's done. You don't see it that often. You often see players... I mean, we've just seen, say, Frank Lampard retire this week. He's 36 or 7 now. Um, and instead of, you know, maybe going to America and earning kind of a big paycheck, he's sort of... He obviously retired from international football after the... Uh, World Cup was it? Yeah, after um, the World Cup win, yeah, and which is you know the pinnacle of any player's career, and then he's retired. You know, at the end of the season after a period of unprecedented dominance with the team that he spent his entire career at. Mm. So uh, you know, I, I, I think fair play to him. I will say, him. is he the highest rated player on FIFA to just retire? Eighty eight rated this year. Can't think of many players who retired yeah. on a rate in that high. I mean, Ibra might challenge it, but yeah, that's you, true. You're pretty good. And my favorite thing about uh, Philip Lyon is that his nickname is the Magic Dwarf. Yeah, I like to believe that's also, like named after like an event at a party or something. The Magic Dwarf. Uh, also, we we mentioned City just before that as well. Lam was the player when Guardiola was at Bayern Munich. He famously said that he was literally the best player that he had ever coached, or you know, had been able to yeah, use well, he, in a team. He hadn't coached James Milner at that stage, and still hasn't. So until then, until he's managed all <laughs> the top players. <laughs> I think we'll hold fire on saying that about Philip Lahm for now. Let's say for now. Philip Lahm, the best player Pep Guardiola has managed Of a retiring news, Ben, before we go. Lampard retired. 
He did. Yeah. I mean, I feel in many ways like he'd already, he already retired. Had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's fair. Um, but it's not but, that yeah. interesting, his retirement. The interesting retirement of the week, Digital Cissé is becoming a DJ. I love everything about it. It is, as someone said on Twitter today, it is the most Gibral Cissé thing ever <laughs> to retire from football and at the same time announce, I shall be a DJ now, which I think is fantastic. Um, but he he was one of my first sort of, he's a bit, well, not first, but he was a showbiz player, especially when he came to Liverpool. The haircut um, was showbiz. Yeah, I've, I've seen him score a goal in the flesh. That's how, so I, you know, I've got a little bit, a little bit of love for Cissé. Um, he he was just very fast, wasn't he? He was this French fast striker that came to the Premier League. Didn't light it up probably as people thought he would do, um, but he was he was a good player for Liverpool. He, he also played at QPR, didn't he? My one memory really of Cissé is when he celebrated with the City players after QPR were beaten but survived. Uh, yeah, on the, and City on the Aguero won the league. Day. Yeah, on the, the fact that he celebrated with the it was a very Liverpool thing. I, I applauded that. Yeah, he was in charge of the after party. On that one. I could imagine he was. He was. I remember him kissing Sami Nazari, which I mean, if you've read things recently, that's a risky thing to do. Um, <laughs> allegedly, uh, <laughs> let's get out of here, Ben. Let's, let's get, get out of here quickly. So this made us think, uh, folks listening. Leave it in the in sort of the Twitter at replies or the YouTube comment section. Uh, footballers that will retire and immediately take up another profession. I mean, hopefully, gentlemen, you've been thinking of a potential one, and if not, you're going to do so in the next 10 seconds. Um, but I, I think Mike Lowen would make a, a fantastic postman. Just yeah, wandering around, seen... whistling. There's an little... amazing video of Mike Lowen. Have you seen where he does a tour of Dubai pretending to fly a yes, helicopter? Yes, and it's that is very really strange. Screen. If does you've not seen with, that video... Hello, I'm Michael. Welcome. <laughs> yes. to, and he goes... Welcome to my helicopter tour around Dubai. If it's you've like, not seen what that is video, going on? It's here? one of the most bizarre things. It's an <laughs> what incredible is going video. On? I yeah, encourage it you like, to find it on YouTube as soon as the podcast is over. So I, have, I think he'd make a good like <laughs> nature commentator, you know, like on a he'd wildlife love, show. He'd be a good pilot, to be fair, Owen. He would be a good pilot. If you, you've got to think, like, from a. Okay, from a, comp- a consumer perspective, the only thing you want in a pilot is he makes you feel assured. Now, if Michael Owen came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, it's me, Michael Owen, I'll be your pilot, look forward to have a safe journey, sit tight, we're going to be okay. I think, do you know what, Michael knows what he's on about. I'd yeah. love that. I think he could be a yeah. good southern rail, yeah. rail train driver as well. I mean, is, do yeah. such things exist, Jack, I, based I mean, on what I read? I, I mean, rail? questionable, depends if they're working or not, doesn't <laughs> it? Have you boys got any others that you want to throw my way? Um, I mean, I was going to say Lam and a football manager, but that felt a bit obvious. I think, oh, I mean, that is very dull, Jack, I'll be honest. Don't leave <laughs> football manager. I think Frank Lampard could become, become an assistant. <laughs> Don't leave that. I want to know sort of random ones. Keen, are any ex-Villa players that you think could do jobs as, yeah, as other no, that, that wasn't what I thought. I thought maybe uh, Adebayo Akin Fenwar could, you know, star alongside The Rock or something. That would be quite funny. I mean, I, I can't wait for that. Yeah. Vinnie Jones. I can imagine no, doing no, Vinnie no, Jones. Jack, you've not yeah, thought this, he, you've he, thought this through. It'd about... be Fast 11. Akin Fenwar will be part of the crew in Fast <laughs> yeah, 11. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. He could do a Vinnie Jones. He could be the guy to go, you know, he was, Vinnie Jones is never a, a top player, but I can Can, can it be, be a player who's already retired? Because I'd like to see can Freddie Lundberg become a lookalike to the chicken in the wrong trousers, Wallace and Gromit. I mean, that doesn't suggest he'll get much work, <laughs> but I, I admire I mean, the ref- fe- reference fe- going to be incredibly fe- on point. Feathers fe- but... McGraw would be a fantastic attendant, like lookalike to him, would be fantastic at any party. All right, okay. yeah. I mean, listeners, yeah. you can't do much worse than the three we've come up with, so by all means, let I us know. I'm trying to think of footballers that would be good, like, kids' TV no, presenters. Jack. no. Oh, no. Ooh, and with that, if you've enjoyed this week's <laughs> show, do leave a like on the YouTube video if you've watched it or listened to it on iTunes. Uh, do give us a rating on there. We, we like to read out the best ones. We've had one for a while, so I mean, by all means, leave one. Uh, of course, as well, Twitter. At, not sure what not sure what that means. <laughs> at, at for the fan show. <laughs> not sure what that means. That's funny. Uh, and that brings us to the end then. Kino, thank you for joining me. We, we've been pretty close to the edge this pod. There's we a have. few things that I might, may Colo or may not Torre have to would be fantastic on CBBS. Oh, the four, the, up, four the four the fans lawyers have worked overdrive this week. So uh, we'll see you again from Jack. Goodbye. And from me, Ben. We'll see you again next week, next Tuesday slash Wednesday. Look out for it. Um, and why not share this podcast with your friends? They might even enjoy it. Right then. We love this care. From us at For The Fans, we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. It's perfection. Kina, I think you're going to have to be calling for an oxygen mask over here, my friend.